So hello everyone and welcome to the fourth episode of the DeerCast. Um, I can't believe we've even made it this far um, despite some of our technical difficulties uh, and our level of uh, professionalism. Um, today we are really really lucky um, we've got Peter Gibbon uh, with us. Uh, some of you probably have come across uh, Peter on uh, Instagram as the Outdoor Gibbon. Um, very uh, interesting Instagram handle, if I can say so, Peter. Um, he is a mad keen deer stalker like Harry and I, um, but with a slight difference in that he's based up in Aberdeenshire. So I, I think when he saw some of the uh, Instagram stories and pictures that Harry and I were sort of posting uh, down here in the south of England, he, he thought we were sort of stalking in boys country, basically. Um, and we've, we've had a bit of banter over that. Anyway, Following the kind of similar um, format, some of our previous podcasts, um, we're just going to have a quick chat with Peter about how he got into deer stalking, the kit he uses, what he thinks about sort of current developments within the industry, if I can call it that, um, and we'll just kind of freestyle it from there, basically. So, Peter, welcome, lovely to have you on. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself, how you got into how you got into deer stalking? Yeah, no problem. Uh, thank you very much for having me. So, um, how did I get into deer stalking? Well, it probably started about 15 years ago. And I think really it was, I started off with my just getting back into shooting. Uh, that was the main thing. After shooting at school, uh, the next progression was to get on to, I'd shot a lot of rabbits and things like that and foxes. And I was interested in deer. So, it, it really kicked in for me was was going out and doing my my level one my deer stalking level one uh and meeting people on that course and getting a sort of an invitation to go to southern ireland to the county wicklow area to stalk seek a deer something i'd never done and it was sort of baptism of fire because at the end of the day i believe that seeker are probably one of the the most complicated deer to, to stalk you'll be uh, walking along and the deer are 15 yards into the wood looking at you. They know you're there. You have no idea they're there. So uh, that's where Pick, my... It's yes, a really co- easy species to start on then. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, as I said, baptism of fire, choose the, the hardest species of deer to stalk. If you can stalk that, stalking everything else just becomes a bit of a piece of cake, really um so yeah it it led on from there um i moved up to scotland seven years ago because as you can tell i don't have a scottish accent so i'm not originally from there what was the reason for the move uh the reason for the move was uh a basically work i was headhunted by a company up there and asked to come up and try and solve problems with their service side of things so that got me to Scotland and my stalking land has actually mostly come from my business. So when I do work, I, I do a lot of work with biomass boilers. And taking that into account, you get chatting to landowners. And the next thing you find out is the landowner owns a 300 acre wood and you ask whether you can stalk it. And they go, yes, because you're going to fix my boiler when I phone you. And it kind of developed from there. So gradually land just became I, I pick land up quite often purely because of the nature of my business i i was about to ask how you balance being a, a full-time um worker if if you like and deer stalker on the side but it, it sounds as though you're managing that quite quite capably if you're managing to procure stalking at work as well yes so normally the rifle is with me and it will be a case of either early morning or going out to uh, somebody's land but at the same time you'll be heading to do some work for them or you get a phone call that somebody needs something and you think well actually i'm going there i'm going to be passing my land so what i'll do is i'll stop on the way home have a stalk uh put something in the back of the truck take it home and stick it in the larder so it, it's a fine work balance but it, it actually works really well uh, nice. so yes and, and, and do, do you have a, a larder of your own or or is the larder sort of similar to to us a sort of uh diy at home type setup it, it's very much a diy home type setup so it's actually um a couple of commercial fridges that i've modified uh with hanging bars in them they're really good because they've got the the air movement in them so you don't actually dry your carcass out too much 
and then most of the butchery I actually do is all done in our utility room set it up with a hanging point I'll skin everything outside break it down outside uh, take it in the house final butchery um, or obviously hygienic at the at the end of the day uh, backpack it and it's uh, put in the freezer to share with friends and family and it, is, is that how you dispose of well I say dispose of that's awful um, terminology it, is that sort of what you do with most of your carcasses or do some go to game dealers or some to pubs restaurants and that sort of thing or are they all sort of personal consumption and or family and friends yeah no all of my dear uh, because the game dealer market in Scotland basically fell through the floor if we have clients over and I've taken for example we had some French clients and we shot a few bucks I did take those to a game dealer because at the end of the day I don't need five or six bucks to process but with the game dealer prices as they are I think they dropped to the lowest was like a pound a kilo uh, it's just not worth it by the time my game dealer is an hour's drive away so by the time you've been up there and you're getting 18 pound for a row uh, it's really not worth it. So it's easier to process everything, break it all down and then dish it out. We also, um, we feed our scout group whenever there's a camp and things like that on venison. So, uh, yeah, my scouts are probably some of the best, wow. well, mo wo most well-fed scouts in the, uh, in the UK. How do they take to the venison? They love it. Uh, every single time we've got a camp, they, and they were sorely disappointed that the last one, cause I didn't do the supply all the food that it wasn't venison mince oh wow that's fantastic and you touched on a whole whole different element that that's something that harry and i don't do there which is is client stalking so is that something you've always always done or is is that something that's kind of evolved over the years as a way to kind of pay for pay for your stalking or do you do it because you enjoy it or how, how how did it start no it started purely because it's a very small Aberdeenshire is classified as the large village kind of thing. So everybody knows everybody and stalkers around will know that you can do things. So sometimes they've got too many clients and you end up getting a phone call. Oh, could you take out somebody? And it, it turned into that. I got to know a French guide and he basically said, I've got a client. Can you take him out? And it's not something I like to do. I I'm not a keen fan on taking out people who you know are purely out to hunt a trophy. Uh, and I've stood there many times and presented good Robux to people and I get told, no, it's not big enough. And then we get to the end of the night, well, towards towards dusk and the d light's falling and they've, they've not seen anything else and they suddenly go, I want to go back and get that one. It's like, no you can't because by the time we get there it's probably gone it's probably in the next it's four fields away or something like that so no commercial stalking for me is not something i want to do um but i'll you'll see that and i think my last podcast which we spoke about was all about the offering of free hunts to people uh, it's a, it's about getting people actually i'd rather take people out that haven't shot before or are new to stalking and introduce them to it because I think that's more important than somebody that wants to come over and spend a load of money on trying to get the best robot they can. So big kind of ethical question for you. Do, do you think trophy hunting does more damage for our, our sport than than good? That's a it's a tricky one to talk about because at the end of the day, I think the deer stalking market in the UK has become very driven by money and it, it always is and it all well everywhere it is but I think the UK there's the green eyed monster comes out and when it involves money and high quality trophies then yes pe people will always seem to make what's the word I'm looking for it, it kind of you get that sort of negativity to it yeah I I've got to admit, I I started sort of this by saying neither Harry or I do do guided guided stalking or or trophy stalking or anything like that. I mean, I I thought I was going to do it at the start and took took a few people out and I I take out sort of friends of friends or or people I perhaps sort of owe a favour to and and every time after I do it, I always regret it because nine times out of ten it's it's more hassle than it's worth or something goes wrong and you think, oh for goodness sake, if if I hadn't taken this person out, it would just be sort of hassle free and I. I'd, I've stopped stopped doing it as a result, and I, I think mm. think Harry's pretty much the same as well. Yeah, I did it a, a few times with some sort of German clients who were after 
Munchak and things like that. And I always just felt like they're, they feel like they're paying for it. And so they're entitled to a certain amount of service and therefore don't put in the effort that's kind of needed. Um, I don't know if you found that at all. Yeah, normally if you've got somebody out with you, the the stress levels of actually producing a deer uh, really do get to you. And I get back from a, a stalk with, with a paying client and you're usually absolutely knackered. Whereas actually when you go out on your own for a stalk or you're taking somebody that you know as a friend and just uh, you have you have a bit of banter. You you can have a chat about it. It doesn't matter that you might not shoot something, but when you've got somebody there that is expecting, it it really does. It 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 gets quite hard and 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 normally it's it's quite tiring to be honest. So it, so have you got have you got access to Row Red and Seeker in where you are in Aberdeenshire? You have to forgive my complete ignorance, or are you just Row or Row and Red or so. We are predominantly row. Um, I have some, I have some land that has stray released park deer, ex park deer that migrate through it. So you'll occasionally get a red. Uh, we've caught reds on cameras and things like that. Aberdeenshire isn't somewhere that does have seeker. You need to push up slightly further north towards Inverness, and there are seeker. Um, but none of my so my land basically consists of a lot of row and the occasional red. And you talked a bit about your competitions and things like that. I was listening to your last podcast. Have you got one coming up that people are going to be entering in to win some more sort of stalking? Some of the stories you told on the last podcast were really interesting. Yeah, I, I plan to run another competition at some point. I've just got to sit down and do all the necessary pulling everything together. Uh, as for the stalking side of it, it's easy because it, obviously it's just me and finding the time to do it. But it's always nice to put some extras into it, as in when Harkila supplied me a, a base layer, uh, I, I messaged them. Oh, I messaged pretty much every single outfitter I could think of and ask for something. And some companies you get no response from, other companies go, we don't do that. Um, Harkila were great. Uh, they said, no problem, we'll supply you a fleece let me know uh when you want it and what size and it will be delivered so yeah um hopefully we'll get another competition up and running uh, may well put another knife in it I've, I've made some more recently so maybe put one of those in and uh offer offer some more stalking because people seem to like that and as, as again there's no pressure because if it's a novice coming out they they're not paying for it and they're not you kind of get them a bit more at ease and I think that's the the best way to sort of share the knowledge at the end of the day. Yeah, well, there you go. Great plug for Harkila and we, they didn't even ask us to do that. So there you go. Um, so getting on to the, the bit that people always, always seem to ask about, people are always really interested in is, is and I know you've got quite an interesting take on this because I've seen it on one of your, your Instagram posts. Um, what kit do you use and why and how, how have you ended up using what you use and by that i mean sort of caliber of rifle what rifle do you use what scope do you use do you use a thermal um or hit us with everything okay so multiple calibers uh and there is there's a, there's a tool for every job at the end of the day now scottish law compared to english law uh, says that i can actually use a 223 as a for, for taking row um, which in England you can't do that. The 223 can only be used for shooting, I think, Munchak. Um, so it really depends on what mood I'm in and where I'm going. If I ever take anybody out stalking, it will always be a smaller calibre rifle purely because there's no kickback. I love my 308. It, uh, it's, a, it's an old Tika M65 long action. It was rebarreled. Uh, by Mike Norris, Brock and Norris, uh, and it shoots it shoots absolutely perfectly. Now it is a bit of a beast of a rifle for for sort of taking out to shoot row because it, it you'd almost say it's over calibered, um, but it does exactly what it says on the tin. And yeah, again, it it's just something that I enjoy. Uh, let's just go you're, through. You're in scripts. very good company oh. with the 308 because I I'm I'm a long term 
308 uh, supporter and then in the last six months have managed to con well convince Harry to go out and buy a 308 which he's done as well so it's um well it's just it's just so versatile isn't it um and did you get the Brock custom rifle guys to do your loads as well no so i'd already home loaded so no my loads have always been something i'll develop myself and have a play with um so no they just put a new barrel on it i i was heading to ireland actually so i was driving down the country uh phoned him up dropped my rifle in had a long chat with him left it there and disappeared off to ireland with my 243 went stalking and uh, when I got back, he said it, oh, it It took a long time, let's just say that, but he did have it shipped up to me in Scotland and I was over the moon. So that's my my rifle normally is either the 223 or a 308 for, for most of my stalking. Scopes, let's move on to that. So a big fan of me optoscopes uh, before they were famous. Uh, that was purely the, the lad I used to stalk with in Ireland. He had a me opta great light gathering they were cheap scopes so we ended up with i think we walked into one of the the wholesalers with a wad of cash and we walked out he didn't want to sell us scopes but we walked out with three scopes at the end of the day so it's it's all it's flashing the cash and you you kind of get what you want and that's when the formula became really sort of um sort of the high end scope and, and actually went up in price quite considerably however on that 308 that you've seen photos of it's currently running a very old doctor purely because it was a scope I had kicking about. I threw it on and it does exactly what it says on the tin. They are all um, illuminated reticles just for that low light, especially woodland type of areas where you can light up a dot and it does help on a silhouette. Do they, do they even make doctor scopes anymore? Or... I don't think so, no. No. I've, I've seen, seen a couple of the um, red dot ones before. And that's a red dot you've got on your 308? Yes, yes. Oh, very interesting. Is that just because it's so much wooden stalking that it's so close range you don't need any mag or anything? Oh, I don't, I don't mean it's just a red. It's a standard reticle, so it's a standard crosshair. But in the middle of that, there's a tiny illuminated red dot. Uh, Meop to do uh, it with a, with a little dot or a cross. Um, again, it's, it's ideal for that just that time at dusk when you start to everything starts to sort of the, the the silhouette just starts to disappear and, and getting your crosshairs can be quite hard work so if you've got that illuminated dot it just gives you that little bit of an edge yeah tom's got that on his rifle and it's really handy at last light i have to say it 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 i, I didn't i thought it was a bit of a gizmo until i actually i sort of got one with it and and to be fair i probably don't actually use it as much as i thought i was going to but the, the the occasions when you do use it it's it is awesome um i mean i used it not last night i think it was night before um to head shoot a pricket um which was i mean it, it just made all the difference really because it it's when it's it's when especially the deer itself is if that's kind of dark colored it's getting really dusky and you put the crosshairs on something and just to be able to see bang exactly where those crosshairs are and they really stand out you it just gives you that bit more confidence i think yeah no that, that that's it and as i say it's not something that you use all the time um but it, it, it's it's there for when you need it yeah and, and what's your sort of philosophy on magnification are you again, like a fixed power person or are you do you have sort of wind up to 24 power and crack on kind of thing no none of my scopes go more than 12 mag normally they sit at around about seven or eight well traditional score stalking scopes were non uh, adjustable magnification they were all i've got an original meopter uh seven times mag by 50 and that that was a traditional stalking scope it you, none of this adjustment came and it's funny i actually had somebody send me a message the other day asking oh i'm thinking of changing my my scope to something with more range uh and more magnification and I'm like, what do you use it for? And he's like, oh, a few hill reds and um, I think it was and an row. And I'm like, well, how far away are they? Do you need that much magnification? More magnification means less light gathering and more the scope moves more the harder you wind it up. We we had a very, very similar conversation with our, our last guest, Justin Carter, who's a local stalker, taxidermist and 
general dear entrepreneur and he he swears by was it fixed pat eight by 56 scopes and he yeah. basically sim- simplicity is king for him and he said the light gathering you just won't beat them um and to be fair my my scopes are three to 12 i think it is and i mean to be honest 99 percent of the time it's set on either six or seven power and i tend not to really adjust it unless unless i'm i don't know head shooting something or really stretching it out um further than I normally would so I I think there's absolutely something to be said for for decent kind of fixed power scapes. I completely agree and the, the key is it's whether or not it, it it's how good it is at dawn and dusk that that's if a scope goes milky or you start to lose vision at those times you're wasting your time and, and a lot of uh, magnification scopes with lots of um what's it uh, the sort of coatings on the lenses if they're not good enough that's when you start to to have issues whereas if you get a scope that that really gathers the light and has the right coatings it should just transition through uh, the dawn and dusk period with no issues at all yeah i don't i don't know because we we should have said the three of us were all, all bumped into each other at the stalking show and had a good kind of chin wag there but I, I don't know if you noticed, Peter, because we're at the stand. We were helping on the Harkeela Sea Land um, stand, which was almost sort of next door to the Leica stand, and we went to have a look at one stage. And I, I'd always in my mind thought of Leica as a kind of hunting um, uh, brand in terms of scopes. But actually, when we went to have a look at them, all the ones they had on their stand, and that might just be because those are the ones they chose to take to the stalking show. But they were all kind of like big scopes with big tactical turrets sort of all the accessories all the bells and whistles on them and i i sort of feel within the the shooting industry that that's what we're all being encouraged to to have and i think as a result a lot of people especially when they're first starting out and go to buy that first scope think well i'm going to have to go for a cheaper worse quality glass because i must have adjustable parallax illuminated reticle and it must go to 24 times magnification rather than going you know what i'll buy a fixed part eight by 56 schmidt and bender for 400 quid because all the money that i'm spending actually is going on the glass not all the kind of rinky dink accessories that go with it yeah it, it's always been one of those things and i think you see it more and more uh, with social media how people are trying to push to the next level fox shooting for example it's all about how far out you can shoot it and then you start seeing people going oh i was deer stalking and shot a deer at 200 yards well actually deer stalking is getting up close and personal and i would say that 90 percent of my deer are probably shot sub 100 yards uh, purely because that's what stalking's about it's actually being able to see what this what the deer is doing yeah you can have a, a scope that winds in but it's not really stalking at that point it's more just shooting yeah i mean well whilst we're quickly on it and i know this is going slightly off topic of, of equipment but what what did you think of the the very first and hopefully not the last um stalking show yeah no absolutely obviously i drove all the way down uh the 400 mile 440 mile trip to uh i was working down in leicestershire um but yeah to come to that show to meet people to actually put um virtual profiles to actual real people uh yeah no definitely uh something to to grow from that uh especially with its cost and entry fee and all the rest of it was great so if they can keep that going it, it's certainly worthwhile so yeah. car- carrying back on with kit um sound moderators have been obviously one of those things when i first started going to ireland my tika with its original barrel was unthreaded so there was no sound moderator so it was a big boom and and it was great and you slightly go deaf but you knew you'd shot something uh having the having it moderated trying to save my hearing so i can actually um, hopefully hear things in in uh, in old age uh the 308 is actually fitted with a, a a dpd moderator um the the modular unit that you can uh take as many baffles on and add add more baffles or take baffles off it's very good it's it it seems to do the job very well it's aluminium so it's very light it doesn't affect the balance and then my old 223 has an old t4 um very heavy steel construction moderator but again does exactly what it says on the tin um and 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 just works yeah and i'm 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 looking at your some of your pictures on instagram at the moment um so and then in addition to all of that harris bipods by the looks of things 
it, it is a Harris bipod. I've been through oh, all sorts of bipods because when you first start out with air rifles, you you don't want to spend the money to buy a Harris bipod. Um, and I've had all sorts, but yeah, that that that's very unusual for me to have a bipod on it purely because of the land that I'm shooting down here. Uh, when I was down in Leicestershire, is it's a it's a strange farm. It's it was designed for a shoot, so. I wasn't sure what I was up against, so I threw the Harris bipod on as well as my sticks so that I could use it. In the end, the bipod's mainly just there. It seems to just stop the rifle lying on the floor. But 90% of the time, if I'm out woodland stalking, there's no bipod on my rifle. It, it's purely I'm either with sticks or I'll use what nature provides as a, as a rest to shoot off. I mean, Tom and I have found ourselves moving to exactly the same direction i used to shoot a lot of a bipod and as soon as i got quad sticks which i'm assuming is what you're using or sticks of some description uh so stick wise um been through all sorts uh started off with just a, a very cheap pair of uh like a extended bipod stick at the end of the day um i made my own quad sticks um when they first came into fashion i uh, made a set of those Again, not something I, I like taking out. They were a fantastically stable uh, shooting position, but actually I had opted in the end for um, the Gen 2 Primos trigger sticks. Uh, very adjustable, easy to work with, um, especially with uneven terrain. Uh, for example, Clearfell or something like that, because each leg is adjustable, you can get a very stable position very quickly. Uh, they seem to work well. I mean, I, I, I guess because you, you, you said most of your stalking is, is woodland stalking, less than sort of 100 yards. It, it's at row and I'm I'm guessing most of it is chest shooting. So you're you're probably up on the sticks quick. Um, make a chest shot. Um, it doesn't have to be. I don't mean this really. It doesn't have to be kind of like pinpoint accuracy in terms. You don't need that stability that quad sticks provide and actually kind of a one one point on of, of contact between sticks and gun is, is enough for that quick quick shot i'm guessing yeah it's not always a chest shot uh neck shots head shots um okay. they have have been done uh you get used to it it's all to do well at the end of the day i i had a friend out, a photographer out with me and i set him up and got him to look through that and he goes how do you keep the rifle stable because obviously it was moving all over the place but it's you get to you get used to how everything works you get used to your breathing pattern you get used to the single point when we when in ireland when we were doing uh stalking out there we had to do the irish um well we we did the irish uh equivalent to the dsc1 which was called the h cap and we hadn't we didn't know we had to shoot off sticks and we never took sticks to ireland because of the nature of the the stalking so actually having to shoot the dsc1 target off a walking stick a single point uh was was quite good fun so if you can do it off that yeah you can you can do most things doing, doing pretty well i have yeah so primos um trigger sticks and you you haven't been tempted to to upgrade the because i know you can get an upgraded head on them to swap out to a spartan head and then then you could have a detachable bipod as well and I, i'm very enthusiastic about these because i i I've always kind of looked at the Spartan gear with great uh, scepticism until, I don't know, maybe six months ago. And then I was a, a convert to their their bipods because, as, as Harry said, we here the terrain we've got the very, very limited opportunities to take a shot off a bipod. And I, I kind of hate the idea of having a bipod permanently stuck to the bottom of the rifle. So the Spartan system where it just clips on and clips off really kind of appeals to me. No, it's not something I've looked at at the end of the day. Um, it the system I've got works and you don't fix you don't try and fix what ain't broke at the end of the day and if it works it works and I just crack on with it there'll always be something and there's always something new to buy and I think that's one of the things I've, I've discussed before it, it goes like with your clothing and things like that if it works you just use it uh that's the way i look at it now carrying on obviously we've we've done the rifle there we've done the sound mod we've looked at the optics you you raised a good point about thermal and i've had this discussion with many people thermal has its place but it was a discussion with the gamekeeper actually today um on the estate i'm staying at down in in leicestershire um he was talking about how he sees all the muntjac with thermal 
and um, and things like that. And I said, I wish I'd brought mine. But actually, do you know what? It's one of those things. I'm glad I didn't bring it because it really does put you back to basics. Having to use a set of binoculars, having to watch the land and work out where that deer is coming from or look for the signs of movement. It really puts field craft back into where it should be. Whereas I think thermal, you quickly scan around, oh, there's deer there. I'll just wait for them to come out. Whereas actually beforehand, you probably would have walked past them. So if if, if you're going out on like a normal sort of stalk, um, you know, your everyday kind of you know, going out, would you bring a thermal with you? No, no, my thermal stays either in the truck if I need it at the end of the day or it just stays at home. My thermal is mainly used for foxing and other gamekeeping stuff that I do on the on our pheasant shoots. So 90 percent of the time, the thermal's not taken out. However, if I'm going out, I, I have several bits of woodland that have uh, night licenses and out of season shooting. If I'm going out there or I'm doing a deer count, thermal is going with me uh, purely because it's an essential tool at that point. Yeah, and I guess you use it for uh, tracking and follow up and sort of deer surveys and that sort of stuff as well. Yeah, I think that's kind of what me and Tom are. We're looking at one for particularly around we are and there's lots of fallow deer and we're essentially trying to get a good number of how many are on our land. Um, using it for that sort of purpose rather than necessarily going out and using it every single stalk. Yeah, absolutely. For for counting numbers, for, for me, it's like you can assess quickly numbers of deer with a thermal. It's great. Um, follow up and tracking is an interesting one. We've had it a few times um, where the thermal is absolutely useless, even because if, if you're out on a clear fell or something like that, if the deer drops into a slight hollow, you can be scanning with the thermal and you will not see it. Oh, really? So not even a blood trail or anything like that. I mean, me and Tom don't use thermals at the minute. I mean, mainly for financial reasons, but um, I, I'm surprised. I thought you'd be able to see some sort of heat signatures from footprints or blood or something like that. Well, obviously, if, if you if you've shot a deer, say, 100 yards away, by the time you've picked your way across the clear fell, it could have taken you five or 10 minutes, maybe even half an hour. Um, at which point those tiny specks of blood will have will have become ambient temperature. Mm. So you're still looking for the heat source, which is obviously the deer. Now, sometimes, yeah, it, you can track, you can catch a glimpse of something hot, but we've had it where it's fallen. I I lost a I lost a deer in a carrot field, and literally it had fallen between two rows of carrots. But as you walked across the field, because we had no elevation you physically could not see that deer the 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 actual vegetation there completely blocked out the heat signature you know what you need peter go on is a very enthusiastic labrador you see well you do or as i as i learned the hard way you get on your hands and knees and you actually have to look for the blood spots yourself i'm i'm far too lazy for that um, and I, to be fair, I heard your story. I think was it in your first podcast or your second podcast where the the guy that had very kindly taken you out stalking. Well, I say kindly, took you out stalking, and then basically sort of punished you by making you get on your hands and knees and, and follow the blood trail, which I, I thought was quite cruel for your your first stalk, but quite funny to listen to. Um, and I that I'm I'm far too lazy for that. So I I got a, a lab about a year ago. Um, who I mean I'm not saying she's she's UK DTR standard um, by by any stretch of the imagination, but she's got a far better nose than than I have. And um, if there's ever something I can't can't find or I think I've pulled the trigger and think oh I'm not quite sure where that's gone, um, I let her loose and she nine times out of ten has has found it, which has been amazing. So I, I would highly recommend and the. The companionship as well of having a dog with you is, is something I, I didn't quite realise before. Um, but again, is, is something I really appreciate now. Yeah, so it was my first podcast um, and tracking was the was the key thing that he was trying to get across to me. Uh, also teaching me never shoot a deer downhill. I I do have uh, two spaniels that I work again, but 90%, I'd say 90 percent of the time. I've never lost a deer. I've, we've always found it. I have lost one um, 
and I spoke to, we, we're quite lucky up our way. We do have uh, the deer tracking service. Uh, the chap that does all our skull measuring is is one of the top um, breeds, the tracking dogs as well. Uh, so he's at, he's at the end of a phone. But after speaking to him about everything that had gone on, it was a case of he said, that deer that you've shot will be fine. It was a neck shot. It had dropped on the spot, got over to it was just about to test its eye it got up and it legged it and there literally the speck of blood on the floor uh he said you'd have hit all the soft tissue and you'll have just left a hole in that deer and that deer was as absolutely fine and it will come back and if you wait you'll find it in a in a couple of days and uh, you'll probably shoot it again and did you never no i went back out every night to the same spot waiting and uh, i'm fairly sure one of my neighbors got it ah uh, there you go so there you go we we all we all have bad days and anybody that says they they don't obviously doesn't shoot enough deer no well it no. it was really funny at the the stalking show because the uk dtr guys were there um and I can't remember his name now. He's He's got a dog called Sky because there, there was an incident with me last summer where a friend invited me out to, to shoot a roebuck with him. Um, and really stupidly, I'm going to blame it on him. But basically the roebuck came out and my friend range found it and said, look, it's X distance. So I adjusted for that, pulled the trigger. This thing jumped or so reacted perfectly to the shot. And I was like, brilliant. Friend was looking through the binos the whole time and was like, there's blood pouring out the side of it. Great shot. Well done. Clap your, clap your hands, etc." And then for the life of us, we couldn't find it. So we phoned um, this guy from UK DTR. He came out and we we still never never found it. Anyway, bumped into him at the stalking show. And obviously um, I've spoken to him since and sort of said thanks and all the rest of it, but said thanks again at the stalking show. Um, and he was saying, he was like, it's actually quite embarrassing at the stalking show. He's like, because he, a lot of anyone he recognises or anyone that sort of knows him, he basically only knows them because at some point they've they've had a bit of a, a slip up whilst out stalking. Um, and he said he almost feel, felt a bit sort of guilty going up to people and being like, hi, good to see you again. But at the same time, as you just said, it happens to all of us. We've all been there and kind of holding your hands up to your mistake is is sometimes the, the right thing to do. And, and as long as as long as you deal with it correctly, that that's the main thing and learn from it. Absolutely. As long as you put the effort in to, to track that lost deer, uh, again, you if, if, if you put all the effort you can in to try and find it and you still come up negative and it, you can't find that deer, but you, you've put the time in, happy days, you've done exactly what you say to do. But these people, that they shoot it, it's probably run 30 yards. They have a quick look around. I can't find it. I'll phone somebody. They don't find it because they've taken them back to the wrong place. That's pretty poor effort at the end of the day as a, as a stalker so hence the reason i still when i take novices out they are going to be tracking blood spots and we will walk and follow blood spots and if we lose it we start again and it just gives you that that basic stuff at the end of the day that's the way i've looked at it yeah yeah no that's really interesting and you've talked a bit about the kit that you've got um and on this podcast we used to do a segment called bobby's bits which um i'll explain the name my little brother called bobby is obsessed with kit and he always seems to have a new piece of gear every single week new atlas bipod new rifle new this new that and so we called the segment bobby's bits and it's basically what's next on your kit list because me and tom have always got something on the horizon thinking oh, what am i saving up for so do you have anything that you've got in mind the next sort of thing for you not really i think to be honest i've probably got too much kit as it is my wife always complains that i have too much stuff um so in terms is, of is kit, she within earshot peter is that why you're saying this you're at gunpoint. yeah yeah no 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 no. she's still 400 like miles away so i'm absolutely fine oh no no it's common common thing that she moans about how much kit i've got and definitely i i do have too much kit um so no there's nothing really i need the, probably the next thing that will be something to look at is i currently use a very old and i mean a very old deer hunter jacket uh in real tree it's falling to bits it's a good stalking jacket, but the zip's knackered. Uh, the lining is starting to give up. It's not waterproof, but it just works. So 
possibly a new jacket at some point will be will be on the on the cards but everything else if it as i say if it works i i, I just don't change it i just keep going until until i kill it really so to to make you feel better about the amount of equipment you've got um i think he's the scottish rep for harkeela called ewan harry and i met him a while ago and he he said when we were both saying we're like oh i feel a bit guilty we've got quite a lot of kit he just turned around to a straight face and was like yeah but you know the point of life don't you we were both like no and he was like well just remember he who dies with the most toys wins so <laughs> if you if you're ever feeling guilty about having too much stalking kit just remember that and it, it's all a big competition at the end of the day that's it yeah yeah uh <laughs> he, he's probably also the man in fact you should send him the link to this podcast and be like you see you hear that that's a great plug for you to try and get a free harkeela jacket out of him as well to replace your leaking deer hunter one that's it anyway well maybe maybe um just changing back to looking at kit again binoculars uh i think it's kind of a, a major area that uh get i don't know it's one of those things that you get people always ask what do you use and i've got a set of uh, steiner rangers and they are pretty abused now they normally hang around in the back of the truck and people are like that's a 500 pound pair of binoculars lying on your floor it's like well they're a tool they get used um and again the reason i went for those they're fairly rugged uh they do exactly what they're supposed to do they're pretty good at light and light light levels even at dusk they're really good and they've just they've just done exactly what i wanted i wasn't going to go and spend a couple of grand and buy a set of Swarovskis. um i chose the next best thing which were these these steiners and uh yeah they they are a good good optic they're the ones that the i think it's the american coast guard used don't they is that right i've never yeah, actually used them before they they've got some they've got some massive things that are massively long but these are the the rangers are they're a very compact quite they're, they're pretty light they've got like a rubber coating on them um yeah they they they're, they're very good binocular and range finding no no range finding um i have a separate range finder if i remember to take it out it's again it's an old leica range finder uh we'll do up to a kilometer it was when when range finders were were quite bulky um but 90 percent of the time i was taught that when you're out stalking if you've got telegraph poles or uh power cables going by every power cable is spaced out at 100 yards so range finding down uh some of our, our woodland because it has power lines running through it well you just have to look at the number of poles where the deer is and you can instantly do your range finding I didn't know that. Uh, fence posts and things like that normally are, are laid out at a, a relatively uh, a relatively even spacing. So if you can work out what the distance between two of them are, you can quickly count up where your deer is again and and have a, a rough idea, a quick range find of that. So yeah, normally my my land is is I know it like the back of my hand. I can tell where distances are, where things are, and, and give or take when you've got the three hundred eight set up at zero to 100 yards you know up to 150 yards just crosshairs on and that's it bang it's falling over yeah exactly and i think me and tom agree that like you know the more of these things that you have to do before you take the shot the, the less likely you are to make a shot i suppose you know range find zoom your scope in etc cetera, etc cetera. you know like you say use your field craft and then you don't need these things um but sometimes they're nice to have no, absolutely. And I think that's that's the thing. The key of, of field craft was stalking. If you go back to the old stalkers, that was everything they used. Whereas I think a lot of people are becoming quite reliant on technology. And tech can fail when you're out in the field. And if you're if you're miles from anywhere, actually um tech failing can be a disaster. So if you've if you've got basic kit that doesn't have batteries and things like that, you don't have to worry about any problems that could occur while you're out there yeah 100 percent. and the fi probably final question on kit is and i'm i'm not going to insult you by asking whether you have one of these expensive stalking knives because looking on your your instagram you you seem to make your own yeah so knife wise when i first started my most of my stalking knives were a cheap moira 
uh, a luminous orange knife purely because if you put it down you can find it um, and then I had a go at making knives and now I've made my own stalking knife and it's one of those things you don't feel quite as bad if I lose this yes I made it and it's cost me time but it doesn't cost me anything really um, I still I still take the mirrors out because at the end of the day they're a good tool especially when you're out in the clear fell it's something it's one of those things if it's light almost last light you don't want to lose something and if you put it down it's very easy to lose a dark handled knife especially like my stalking knife yeah so is there anything else kit what i'm trying to think anything else kit wise that we haven't gone through we've covered um well i suppose like the only thing we haven't covered which does is lead us to a little bit down a rabbit hole and i'm conscious of time because we're approaching the hour mark but ammunition are you are you a copper or non-lead convert or are you still a leader or where are you right so ammunition wise obviously home loader uh as all my deer go into my freezer and don't need to go to the game dealer i am still very much i will keep using lead at the end of the day it works in my rifle uh i don't see a big problem with it you don't eat the parts where you've shot anyway um they don't even get fed to my dog at the end of the day other parts will but so yes there's a big push for copper but for me it's something i'm not really that bothered my my collection of um bullet heads is i've probably got enough to see me out for the next 10 years so i don't really need to change over at the moment and just just out of curiosity what why are you a, a home loader is it is it cost is it availability was it out of fun was it a strive for accuracy or what what led you down this i mean I, i'm i'm a home loader as well so i i feel your pain um in terms of those endless nights spent prepping brass and all the rest of it so why did i go down the home loading route purely because it was I think it was the guys I went to Ireland with. They were all home loaders, and they got me into it. Uh, it did, and it it did work out cheaper. We would always buy bulk quantities of everything. Um, you could load up a hundred bullets, and yeah, it was that strive for trying to get things a bit more accurate, uh, especially when fighting with the old barrel on my 308 to start with. Um, I always thought it was something to do with my loads, and I would keep pushing and, and trying different loads to get it to shoot accurately it would always group three and throw one and eventually it became that the barrel was was shot out completely it was knackered uh, so that's why i had a new barrel put on it but yeah i've just stuck with home loading and at the end of the day i found one powder i well i had found a powder that would load everything for my 223 243 and 308 unfortunately the eu banned that so we can't have varget anymore but having a, a fair stock of Varget means that uh, I'm all right for a, a, a couple of years to uh, to keep my loads going and uh, and we'll take it from there. Find a new powder when, when I have to. Brilliant. Well, that's um, been really interesting talking to you, Peter. So thank you very, very much for coming on to the podcast. I think me and Tom have certainly learned some things and it's always really interesting to hear other people's perspectives on gear and sort of approaches to stalking in general um so thank you very very much for your time um to all of our listeners go and check out peter's podcast it's called the outdoor gibbon isn't it that's it yep the outdoor gibbon and you've got have you got some uh something else coming up that or is it sort of um wait and see a bit like ours uh we've we're hopefully we will have an interview with a local game farmer because obviously uh game uh shoots this year are a hot topic at the moment with bird flu issues um so that that is something on the cards brilliant well i look forward to listening to that um but thank you very much to all our listeners for tuning in as ever and we should have another podcast hopefully with another interesting guest coming out in due course so thank you very much, Peter, and we'll catch you all on the next one. Thank you very much.